16 straight seasons of losing are telling me, Matt, don't do it. Don't you do it, but I just can't help myself. I'm starting to get used to Sacramento Kings winning basketball games. The Kings destroy the Clippers in Los Angeles. DeMontis Sabonis and Keegan Murray shine. And the Sacramento Kings handle the first night of a back-to-back about as perfect as you possibly can. I'll explain on today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. My name is Matt George. I have the pleasure of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer for ABC 10 News. Going to be a bit of a shorter pod tonight. Sorry it's dropping so much later after uh, the Kings and Clippers game, which was this afternoon, uh, was out covering some high school football in the rain. So I uh, am still a little bit wet, but I'm very excited to talk about this game here tonight. And like I said, I just can't help myself. I'm feeling good. Good, man. It feels good to be a Sacramento Kings fan right now. Feels good to follow this Kings team. The beam is lit. Seemed like more the majority of nights the beam is lit. Is this what it's like to be a sports fan? Is this what it's you're actually supposed to enjoy yourself this much? That winning the majority of the time actually makes you feel good about the team you cover or the team uh, that you choose to root for. I could get used to this feeling. I am enjoying myself watching the Sacramento Kings play basketball right now. They defeat the Los Angeles Clippers today 123 to 96 inside the Staples Center that might as well have been called Golden One Center. South. It's not even the Staples Center anymore, isn't it? It's crypto dot whatever the hell arena, whatever the crap it is. It's forever Staples to me. And it should be called Golden One Center South tonight because I heard you. I heard you Sacramento Kings fans in attendance. I heard and I saw the light, the beam chance in the fourth quarter. I saw the looks of Tyron Liu and the entire Los Angeles Clippers team on the bench looking around going, what the hell is everybody chanting about? What does this mean? This has nothing to do with us. You're damn right. It has nothing to do with you. It's because Sacramento is taking over and people starting to take notice that the Kings are a fun team to watch. Now, Kings fans, always seem to travel well when uh, when the Kings go down south to uh, to Los Angeles to play either the Clippers or the Lakers. But the, like you, you might be able to sense there's a little bit of an extra buzz around this Kings team right now, and rightfully so. If you're maybe you're a Clippers fan tuning in and want to just hear the Kings side of the story, if so, I appreciate uh, you being willing to have that open mind and uh, sorry about how your team performed today. Although there's a, there's a good reason why the Los Angeles Clippers struggled as much as they did. We'll get into that. Um, but I know a lot of people are suddenly making the Sacramento Kings their league pass team this year. And it's a good thing you are because the Kings are playing a fun brand of basketball. It's also fun to see not necessarily national NBA media personalities, but national kind of NBA accounts, whether it's on social media or or just NBA national kind of figureheads who are starting to recognize, hey man, the Kings are fun. They're playing a fun brand of basketball. How can you not enjoy what the Kings are doing? How can you not enjoy how the Kings fans are responding to what the Kings are doing? If that's you, if you're new to Kings fandom, if you're just tuning in or trying to jump along for the ride, maybe this is your first or second or third Locked on Kings podcast that you're listening to, I say welcome. It is a pleasure to have you, and uh, I hope you're having as much fun as we are having. Maybe you don't deserve the fun as much as we do. We've waited a long time for it here in Sacktown, but to me, you are welcome nonetheless. So I heard you Kings fans uh, in the Golden One Center South today. I heard the light, the beam chants, and uh, I, uh, you know, I, I know that there's still plenty of time for the good old Kings to come back or rather Kings to come back and, and strike us down and, and hurt us. And I know that three game losing streak, that the Kings just came off of uh, scared some people a little bit, but I think with this team this year for real, we can enjoy things a little bit because the Kings are once again, three games above 500 playing very good basketball once again. And it has to do with a lot of different factors. Now, the Kings beating the Los Angeles Clippers, 123 to 96. This is the first time, as far as I know, the first time this season, I believe, that the Sacramento Kings have held a team to under 100 points. Phenomenal. Awesome. Kings don't do that very often. Now, if you want to put an asterisk next to it, you can, 
I'm choosing not to, but that asterisk would have to do with the fact that Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, the two stars of the Los Angeles Clippers, the two that make the Clippers a, some would say championship contender. I don't know if I'm necessarily there yet, but a very, very good team in the Western Conference. Those two being out, yeah, that would have a pretty significant effect on the Los Angeles Clippers offense. But I don't put an asterisk there because any Sacramento Kings fan who's watched the Kings, especially over the last couple of seasons, knows that just because the best players aren't playing doesn't mean that it's guaranteed to be a win. In fact, for the Sacramento Kings, the joke was if the best players weren't playing, it was almost guaranteed to be a loss because for some reason, past Kings teams struggled mightily when it came to dealing with rotation players and, and guys stepping up who had their opportunity, who came in against the Kings with confidence and then really punched the Kings in the mouth. And the Kings had no way to respond to that. That was beyond frustrating from a Kings fan uh, and even Kings media standpoint to watch that happen over and over and over again. Well, the Kings handle their business and really they handle a shorthanded team. I'm not going to say the perfect way, but the way they ought to. Like if you were to play this game on paper, you look at the you look at the rosters, you look at the box scores, you look at how much Paul George and Kawhi Leonard score. You take that scoring away. Look at the rest of this roster and say, okay, somebody's got to replace it, but it's very difficult to replace both Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. Remember, the Kings lost to the Los Angeles Clippers with Paul George playing earlier on this season. So that's a lot to make up. And on paper, Sacramento should have especially with how good their offense has been, should have had a lot of success in this game. Well, we know the games aren't played on paper, but thankfully what looks like and what makes sense on paper, what makes sense just analyzing basketball actually happened for the Sacramento Kings. And that sounds like something that should happen more often than not. But again, if you've watched Kings basketball over the last couple of years, you know uh, that uh, when the Kings are able to pull off what they should pull off, That's just as worthy of celebration as when the Kings maybe pull off an upset upset that we weren't expecting. Even with Kawhi Leonard and Paul George out, we can celebrate the defense that the Sacramento Kings played in this game. We can celebrate the fact that the Kings are 7-3 and over their last 10 games, and they're number three in net rating in the NBA over those 10 games. I think they are number two in net offense behind just the Boston Celtics. We know how good the offense is. And suddenly they've gone from bottom of the league net rating defensively to right now, at least over these last 10 games, they're around that like 16, 17, 18 range. They're middle of the pack. And I've said, if the Sacramento Kings found a way to be a middle of the road defensive team with how good their offense is, they're a playoff team. They are a playoff team in the Western Conference. I'm not talking play and I'm talking six seed or better. Now, I'm not going to say all the way up to number one or number two, but I'm saying a six seed is possible with the Sacramento Kings to actually guarantee themselves a legit best of seven playoff series if they are middle of the pack defensively with the offensive firepower that we know they have. So the Kings are improving defensively. It might be marginally, and again, it's only over a 10-game stretch, not the entire season, but it's still improvement. That's worth pointing out, regardless of who is missing on on the team they're playing against because the Kings played really good defensively against the Indiana Pacers. Uh, the other night. Also, I wanted to point this out too, because this game was very important. This back-to-back for the Sacramento Kings is very important. This game was game one of a, of, of back-to-back Clippers today, the Chicago Bulls on a matinee, Sunday matinee game in the Golden One Center. Those two games are very important because after those two games, the Sacramento Kings embark on a six-game Eastern Conference road trip. And even if there are games on that schedule, teams on that schedule that the Kings should beat or should certainly be the favorites, maybe even heavy favorites in like the Detroit Pistons game to wrap up the road trip. Those Eastern Conference road trips are always difficult. And anytime you go on those road trips, if you can come back at 500, so in this case, three and three or four and two, that's a tremendous win, especially for a team like the Sacramento Kings who hasn't earned the right to take anybody lightly yet, even if they're playing well right now. So getting these games before the road trip is extremely important. Now, it's always a point of debate amongst coaches, amongst media, amongst fans, how to properly handle a back-to-back, right? In game game one, do you go for it? If you think it's a a, a good chance of winning, go for it. Play your players as much as you need to, as if you didn't have a game the next day, not even worry about the next day, get through it, and then worry about it afterwards. Or... Are you attempting to be strategic in the first game, still trying to win, of course, but maybe sacrificing uh, a percentage chance of winning by holding back some of your players or, or, or paying attention to their minutes, not allowing your starters to play 35 plus instead trying to hold them to the low 30s or maybe even high 20s? 
What kind of effect does that have on your bench? What kind of effect does that have on your opportunity to win? And how much rest are you trying to get your team in game one so that they're as fresh as can be for game two? For me, I think the right decision is just to go for it. Like if you think it's a winnable game in game one, if you have a chance to win, don't worry about game two, go for it. And the Sacramento Kings certainly went for it in this game. But the reality is I think the Kings handled this game, handled this first night of a back-to-back about as perfect as you can. And I don't know if it was intentional or not. I think the fact that they had so much success against the shorthanded Clippers really worked in the Kings' favor here because Kevin Herter was the only Kings player to play 30 or more minutes, and he played 30 minutes. Everybody else was in the 20s. Everybody else. Bench, starters, did not matter in the 20s or less. I think the highest bench player to play minutes-wise was like 18 minutes. And I think the highest, other than Kevin Herter, starter was either... I think it was De'Aaron Fox with like 28 minutes. That's a tremendous win for the Kings, especially on game one of a back-to-back where you're traveling back tonight to take on a Chicago Bulls team who's already in town, who is waiting for you, who's coming off of a loss to the Golden State Warriors, but has that day break in in between. I'm not saying the Kings are going to be 100% rested and are not going to feel the effects of playing the second night of a back-to-back a little bit on Sunday's game, but they're certainly going to be more well-rested than maybe they should be having played less than 24 hours or just over 24 hours, I suppose, the day before. That's tremendous by the Sacramento Kings. Tremendous job for the Kings. Did a phenomenal job in this game of scoring in the paint, dominating the paint really 62 to 44 and 18 point, or rather, uh, yeah, 18 point points in the paint advantage is significant. And a lot of that has to do, of course, with the play of DeMontis Sabonis, who shine in this game. Sabonis had 24 points. Shot 10 of 11 from the field, five rebounds, six assists. Now, the reason why those rebounds and assist numbers weren't as high as maybe we expect them to or that they've been over the last few games for Sabonis is because they kind of didn't have to be. Also, Sabonis dealt with a little bit of foul trouble. We'll talk about that. But 10 of 11 shooting from the field, the efficient shooting for Sabonis continues. Over the last five games, he's 36 of 54, which is 66% over the last five games. And the reality is, even with him that efficient, I want him shooting more. It's crazy that Sabonis can score 24 points on just 11 shots. That's excellent. That's wonderful. I want Sabonis taking 15 a game. And I like that at least early on or in stretches, he's looking for himself a little bit more. I know he's the foundation of the offense. I know he gets others involved and that's where he's at his best. And that's what Mike Brown and this offense need from him. But I'm okay with Sabonis getting a little more selfish sometimes because that's he delivers games like this, performances like this. I just have one question though. What has DeMontis Sabonis done to offend referees? Like all of them. I don't understand how NBA officials officiate DeMontis Sabonis. He must lead the league in ticky-tack fouls and late whistles, like getting called for fouls that happened five or six seconds after, or rather before, the whistle is blown. Fouls that are like maybe a push in the back on a rebound when the Kings get the rebound and are halfway up the court in the fast break. Or a foul where Sabonis fouls a shooter, the shot bounces on the rim three times, falls off the rim, is rebounded, and then they blow the whistle. You think I'm exaggerating? I'm not. DeMontis Sabonis was in foul trouble again in this game. I give him credit that, especially in the third quarter, I think he picked up his fourth foul pretty quickly in the third quarter. Mike Brown chose to let keep him in. He didn't pick up that fifth foul, so good for him there. And I'm not saying he's blameless or that he's never fouling because that's not true. He does hand check and he does get called for correct fouls sometimes. But I want to know if there's any NBA officials or officials, family members, or someone connected to an NBA official who's listening, hey, send me a anonymous message. What did DeMontis Sabonis do when he was young? Did he bully some of these officials in, in college or in, in, in high school? Did he, in junior high, did he say something mean? Did he like date their sister and break their heart? Like what, what, what did DeMontis Sabonis do to pick, piss off or to offend NBA officials? Because for some reason, uh, he just does not get, it's not necessarily respect. He just, he doesn't get, it's not the most interesting or not the, not the best treatment. Certainly interesting, not the best treatment that he gets from NBA officials, but he was able to overcome it. The Sacramento Kings were able to overcome it. Uh, they get a big win. And now I want to tell you about two traits, abilities, quirks of the Sacramento Kings that are extremely unique to this team. 
I'm going to tell you what those two are. Plus, we have to talk about the great game that Keegan Murray had. We're going to get to all that after I tell you about BetOnline.net, an amazing sponsor of the Locked on Kings podcast. Look, maybe in the past you've used BetOnline or other uh, sports gambling sites to make money off of your Kings pessimism. Maybe it was easier for you to sit through Kings losses when you knew you were at least cashing in on it. Well, now it's time to cash in on that Kings optimism because the Sacramento Kings are playing well and you can make money off of the beam being lit at BetOnline.net, your number one source for all your sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. You can get all the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from football to basketball, soccer with the World Cup going on right now, even esports, they have it all at Bet Online. And if you love sports podcasts, you can also find those at Bet Online, including the Locked on Kings podcast. They are always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts. The Sacramento Kings have two really unique qualities, abilities, traits. I don't know necessarily what the right word is, but two consistent aspects of this roster. One of them is extremely unique that has led to their winning ways, but is very apparent and consistent throughout their winning ways so far this season. And that's the the balance of scoring for an offense that is this good. Again, number two offensive net rating in the NBA. The balance of scoring is extremely unique. The Kings put up 123 points in this win against the Los Angeles Clippers. The highest scorer was DeMontis Sabonis with 24 points. The Kings had seven players in double figures, including all five of the starters. If you look through, I'm not going to say every win because I haven't confirmed that, but certainly the majority of wins. If you go back and look at the majority of the wins, the box scores, you will see six plus players in double figure scoring for the Kings. When the Kings score and when the Kings have success offensively, it's by committee. It's not just one guy. Now, Fox has had big games. Sabonis has had kind of big games. We haven't really seen, I don't recall, well, Fox has scored over 40 points at some point this season, hasn't he? Honestly, I don't even remember. They all blend together already. But like, I'll use, for example, the the Brooklyn Nets game, right? The Kings put up 153 points in that game. Their highest scorer is Terrence Davis with 31. Now that's really good for Terrence Davis. The net, No other scorer on the Kings had more than, had, had 20 points or more. Like that's insane. For a team to score 153 points in regulation and only have one player at 31 points, not like they had 40 or 50 like what Devin Booker's doing with the Phoenix Suns right now. They only have one player over 20 points and it's 31. Like that's nuts how well the Sacramento Kings not just share the ball. We know they they lead the league in passes, but how they get everybody involved and how there's so many weapons on this roster that can sprinkle in scoring here and there, whether it's Malik Monk off the bench or Kevin Herter from three-point range, Keegan Murray, Harrison Barnes, uh, Trey Lyles when he's playing, Terrence Davis when he's playing well, Chemezi Metu. Like there's just so many players that can sprinkle in 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 point performances. And they just keep adding up and adding up and adding up to where the Sacramento Kings are suddenly in the 120s, 130s, 140s, 150s in regulation. It's really unique and something I don't know if I've ever seen before in the NBA. Truthfully, I don't know if I've ever seen it before. Now, the other unique quality to this team, although it wasn't as great tonight, but it's still good, the bench output. Like the Kings have had multiple games where their bench has scored 50 points or more. They've had at least one game where they've scored 60 points or more. The Brooklyn game, they scored 60 or more points. In this game, they scored 40 points. Again, no bench player played more than 18 minutes, but the Kings bench combined for 40 points. When that second unit is playing that well, like, what do you do? Like, how exhausted are you as a defender if you have to deal with six to seven minutes out of the gate of De'Aaron Fox, DeMontis Sabonis, and the Kings starting five? Then De'Aaron Fox comes out of the game, and who comes in? Davion Mitchell, you have to deal with that defensive pressure. Or Malik Monk, who's the Energizer Bunny, who arguably plays with more energy and more uh, intensity maybe not intensity, but plays with certainly more energy and more flash and more flair than anybody else on the roster. That's coming off the bench. So you're already tired having to deal with the Kings starting lineup. You bring in your second unit, who's not as good maybe defensively, and they have to deal with Malik. Like, how do you deal with that? How do you game plan with that? We're seeing Kings team or teams struggle with that, and the Kings have been taking advantage. Two very unique qualities to the Sacramento Kings. Now, 
Can we put some respect on Keegan Murray's name, please? Because I've seen the comments. I've seen the emails. I've seen the tweets. Hey, maybe it's time to move Keegan out of the starting lineup. Keegan looks lost. Suddenly the people who were chirping about Jaden Ivey until the summer league started and they disappeared for three months and now they're back and chirping away because Keegan Murray's been through a rough stretch of the month of November. Put some respect on Keegan's name a little bit because he provided a 23 point, eight of 15 shooting, seven rebounds, two steals performance. A really, really solid stat line. Sure, it doesn't match or, or, or live up to the consistent stat lines that Paolo Bancaro is putting up. If you've listened to past podcasts, you know how I feel about that. I think comparing Keegan Murray to Paolo Bancaro is, I mean, you can do it, and I'm not going to say it's not fair, but I think it's a little inaccurate based off of their situations. Now, in the rookie of the year racing, it's fair, and Paolo Bancaro is running away with the rookie of the year race, but Keegan Murray, when you're if you can get a 23 point, seven rebound, two steal performance out of Keegan Murray, you take that and and run to the bank with a massive smile on your face. And the fact that he had a really solid second half, 16 points, went five of eleven from the field in the second half. He really came alive then. Still, the outside shot wasn't falling for him as much as the Kings would like it to. So he was doing a better job getting to the rim, attacking with purpose, uh, finding that mid-range jumper when it was there. I thought he played a very smart brand of basketball. And here's the here's the thing, here's the main reason why I was never really concerned about Keegan Murray. And I talked about this even when he was in his slump. And he might still be in his slump. This is one good game. Keegan never changed the way that he was playing never changed his shot selection, never forced anything when offensively shots weren't falling for him, when things weren't going right. Sure, he made some bad decisions at times. Maybe he wasn't taking the ball to the rim as aggressively as we would like, but he wasn't trying too hard to work his way through the slump, wasn't trying to shoot his way through the slump, wasn't giving himself the green light and taking bad shots. He was still getting good shots within the flow of the offense. They just weren't falling. Now, in games like this, They were starting to fall a little bit. Again, the three could be better, and we expect the three to be better. But if the three is better and he's still scoring 23 points, I mean, it's easy to see why he could flirt with 30 every now and then. not saying he's going to average 30, but he could certainly flirt with it. Not worried about Keegan Murray at all. I give him a ton of credit for how he has worked his way through this slump. Again, it might not be over, but love performances like this. I think they're worth celebrating. Like I said, the Chicago Bulls are waiting for the Kings in Sacramento. Well, I assume the Kings are back by now at the time I'm recording this podcast. But the Bulls, this might be an important game for them as well. We'll talk about that, plus we'll preview this big six-game road trip that the Sacramento Kings are coming are, are about to go on. That is the uh, uh, We'll hit all of that before we wrap up the podcast in just a second. The Chicago Bulls are coming off of a loss to the Golden State Warriors. They are a team that I think is better than their record, and they're off to kind of a rough start. Like, I like their roster a lot. Zach Levine not averaging nearly as many points as he could. Uh, DeMar DeRozan, I know they're missing Lonzo Ball because of his odd injuries. Um, Kobe White, big fan of him. Alex Caruso, big weapon off the bench. I think he got off the bench, right? He doesn't start. Honestly, I haven't watched any Bulls basketball this year. Uh, Nikola Vucevic, very good player. Uh, The Chicago Bulls are not a team that the Sacramento Kings can take lightly at all. And on a second night of a back-to-back, I expect the Chicago Bulls to come into Sacramento and try and put some pressure on the Kings, try and take advantage of the situation. Now, the Kings are by no means a get-right game anymore, so the Chicago Bulls aren't going to expect to get right against Sacramento. They're going to have to work to get right against Sacramento. I'm saying they might have some certain advantages, but the Bulls have lost three of the last four games. So I'm expecting a hungry Chicago Bulls team. I'm expecting an aggressive Chicago Bulls team. I think the the first I think the first quarter of this game uh, Kings and, and Bulls on Sunday is going to be very telling. If the Kings come out flat a little bit, I think the Chicago Bulls could run the score up on them pretty quickly. Now we've seen the Kings have a uh, a a they've shown an ability to come back multiple times. So I'm not saying if the Kings go down by double digits in the first quarter that they're going to get blown out on their home floor. But I, I expect some intensity from Chicago. Do the Kings look rested? Do the Kings look like they may, are making the most out of the fact that they had only one player play 30 minutes in the first night of a back-to-back? Very interested in the first quarter for the Kings. And again, this is an important game for Sacramento to hopefully try and get and have under their belt to build a little more of a buffer in the win-loss column and with their uh, their win percentage because six-game road trip, you got the Bucks, you got the Cavs, both teams, near the top of the Eastern Conference. You have the New York Knicks, 
team under 500, beatable team. 76ers hovering right around 500, very dangerous team. Toronto Raptors hovering around 500, dangerous team. Wrap it up with the Detroit Pistons. If they're out of all these, that's the only game where I will confidently say, yeah, the Sacramento Kings should win. Like the Kings should at the very, very least go one and five on this, this six game road trip. But boy, is that setting the bar way too low for this Kings team. I think 500 is very possible. I will take 500. Now, context is important. If the Kings go 500, but they had a good chance to win all six, maybe I don't feel as good about it. But I will say, anytime you can go on a long road trip and come back winning three of them or splitting them on the road, that's a good thing. Four and two is certainly a possibility. Five and one, six and oh, not out of the realm of possibility when we wouldn't even consider that for the Sacramento Kings in years past. But the games are going to be difficult. We'll get to that when we get to that. How will the Kings handle the Chicago Bulls on Sunday? We'll have to find out. And of course, we'll have a post-game edition of the Locked on Kings podcast. I believe I'll be at that game, uh, plan on being at that game, unless something changes. If so, I'll be doing a post-game pod from the Golden One Center after hopefully a Kings win over the Chicago Bulls. If you're going to the game, please let me know. would love to chat with you. And I can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, hey, enjoy these wins. It's fun. Loosen up a little bit. Let's enjoy it. Light the beam, and hopefully we'll be doing it again on Sunday. My name is Matt George. You have been listening to the Locked On Kings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.